is a celebrated across the world. People got countries have Thanksgiving, but usually they're different dates. Uh, everybody don't even have Thanksgiving. I think European countries do, Britain has, Canada has, we have, but other countries don't. But almost every country in the world, unless it's an atheist country, celebrates Easter and they celebrate. Tonight, I want to talk about uh, the cross and what's happening here on uh, this week, this holy week that we have come into. I entitled this, I Can't Breathe. And I was, uh, of course, impressed by the trial that's going on in Minneapolis uh, with uh, Mr. Um, George Floyd's death. And now they're going through his trial. Uh, and they, they were showing scenes of, of him dying at the hands of the police, at the knee of the police, and him saying, I can't breathe. And when I thought about that and put it in a deeper, broader spiritual perspective, it's what happened to Jesus on the cross because his death actually came about because he had got to the place where he could no longer breathe. And I guess that's what happened to everybody. When you die, you finally get to the place where you just can't breathe no more. Uh, somebody said this man died of a heart attack. That's where we all die of heart attack. Our heart stops. Uh, actually, we know that this was more than a heart attack. We know that this man, unfortunately, uh, uh, was died at the hand of another man, at the knee of another man. I, and this is not a political discussion, so I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying I entitled this Jesus saying, I can't breathe and he died on the cross during that week. You were taking notes, these are great notes to take uh, if you're taking them. So that's what the Bible class is about. What happened on the cross of Calvary? Uh, the song that Mahalia Jackson sung tonight for us was so appropriate uh, because Calvary becomes the center of Christianity. Uh, it is the, the focus of what being saved is all about. That's why we can't stop talking about Calvary. We can't stop talking about the blood, the cross. All of that stuff means so much importance to us, the children of the Lord Jesus. It means more to us than we can ever realize. It's important that we get that if we don't get anything else. So important. The crucifixion. This is how Jesus died through this horrible death that was called the crucifixion. Every society has always had its own forms of death. Uh, usually they execute people in such horrible ways, but the crucifixion was an ex execution that was created by the Romans, and it was one of the most brutal uh, forms of death ever perpetrated on mankind. I don't even think Hitler uh, and, and, and the Germans did a better job than the Romans did with the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus was not the first person crucified. Matter of fact, it was form, it was pro forma. This is what Romans did to people on a regular basis. The crucifixion was bloody. It was excruciatingly painful, physiologically and sociologically, psychologically debilitating. And yet it was a miracle. It was horrible, ugly, horrific, but it was a miracle. And the miracle being because after he had died and went into death for three days, unbelieving to mankind, he got up out of the grave. And the whole history of the world has been changed and turned around and turned upside down. That's why the crucifixion is so powerful. If you don't believe the crucifixion, let me say this, I don't see how you can be saved. Uh, and there's some people who don't believe in crucifixion. They think it's fake news. They think it didn't happen, but it did happen. Crucifixion happened all the time. If you went to Rome, you would see crosses all over the place because this is how they kill people. In America, we used to hang people. But in Roman time, they crucified people. In America, we line people up on the wall and shoot them. Uh, but in the Roman time, they crucified them. Even in today's society in which we live, we inject people with drugs to kill them uh, in the states that still permit uh, death penalties. But in the Roman times, you did something you had no business to do. You went to trial. And you know, of course, the trial usually was all rigged. But you went to trial. 
and you probably ended up in a crucifixion state. This is what happened to Jesus. He got caught up in the political turmoil of the day. He hadn't done nothing at all, nothing worthy of death uh, at all. Uh, and he ended up in a situation where they took him to the judgment hall, the judgment hall, court after court. Uh, and finally, they just crucified him. Let's get this thing over with, get him out of our hair crosses, get this man, because they, the Roman government, their greatest concern was he was causing political trouble, unrest. And so rather than try to uh, maybe give him a chance or give him opportunity uh, to make amends for whatever pen uh, penalties they thought he had committed, they just crucified him. I mean, and it was the worst thing they ever did because what they did when they crucified Jesus, they unleashed history. History changed when they finally got rid of him and they knew it. Now, before they crucified him, there were people who knew that we might not be doing, we shouldn't be doing this. Pilate was one. If you remember, and we'll talk about it maybe somewhere along in the discussion, Pilate at one point got, told him, get me some water. I'm sick and tired of this argument. Should we kill him? Should we not kill him? Should we put him in prison? Should we not put him in prison? Should we just let him go? Give me some water. He brought the bottle, the, the bowl of water there. He washed his hand in such a dramatic way. He said, I'm finished with it. Y'all do what you want to do with it. Pilate turned around and walked away, turned him over to the mob, and they crucified him. Uh, mob justice. This is how Jesus died. Mob justice. Uh, when a mob takes over, they have no regard for law and order whatsoever. It had to be done, though. This crucifixion had to be done. Jesus breathed his last breath, according to Mark 16, 37, when he said, it is finished. Last thing he said, last word that came out of his mouth was, it is finished. And how was he able to say that? Because he knew being God, that this had to be done. His words describe the end of the most painful suffering of any human being in the history of the world. Now, even though there had been crucifixions before this, this crucifixion was worse than any that there ever had been. There's a beautiful picture here that they got. And when I said beautiful, it is beautiful, even though it's the most disgusting and ugliest picture you ever want to see. They beat this man to a pulp. Usually they didn't beat the men or the women that were crucified. They simply put them up on a cross and a cross was nothing but a tree stump. Uh, and usually they didn't even put their hands up like Jesus had his hands put up. Usually they just hung down to the side. But with Jesus, they put him up on the cross, a tree that was bad, probably had the bark taken all of it, just threw him up there, stripped him naked, threw him up there. Uh, and then they put nails not in his uh, hands like we're told, but in his wrist. Put the nails through his wrist so to make sure that he stayed up there on the cross. Put the nails through his ankles, made sure that he didn't slip down from there. And then they beat him half to death while he was on the cross. And you gotta remember this was around the time, uh, April, uh, the weather was very, very good, probably very warm. We're talking about that climate and that part of the uh, the world. And so it was excruciating uh, physiologically, meaning his, his physical self suffered. Nobody could have endured this. That's why it was the most human uh, suffering that the world had ever known. And when people finally went to see Jesus, and we, we only know about Mary and her group, uh, and the soldiers around the cross, but people would come to crucifixion just to see people die. Almost like they used to do when Negroes was hung in the South in this country. People would show up at the hanging just to see people die. They just wanted to see somebody hang from a tree. This was worse than the worst hanging that we have ever endured in the United States of America. Uh, suffering with a purpose though, because Jesus knew I got to do this. It is impossible for us to know which was greater for Jesus, the physical suffering or the emotional and mental torture that he endured. Because even though physical suffering is horrible, there might not be anything more horrible than you mentally and emotionally suffering. That's what's wrong with many of us 
we're suffering mentally and emotionally. We go crazy. I can imagine that there on that cross, suffering like Jesus suffered physically, that there were moments when he was out of his mind. He probably went crazy. And I'm talking about his humanness, his human self. He probably lost his mind. You put yourself in this predicament. Could you have even endured anything like that? You can't hardly endure people talking about you. It caused too much emotional pain and mental torture. You can't ha handle what you think people are thinking about you. It caused too much emotional and mental pain. But Jesus endured all of this. Humanly, he was saying, why do I got to do this? Spiritually, he was saying, I got to do this. So there was this dichotomy in his mind. There was a struggle going on in his mind while his body was suffering. While they beaten him, he was thinking, why do I have to do this? And then on top of this, Mark 15, 34 says, he asked God, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? So in the midst of the physical suffering and the emotional and mental torture, this thing of rejection pops in there. When he felt totally alone, there's almost no horrible, more horrible experience that human beings can experience than when they feel totally isolated. This is when people do things like commit suicide, uh, when they don't feel like nobody cares about them whatsoever, and they feel the only relief they got is to find a way to end it. And we thank God that the humanist did not take over Jesus, our Lord, that he didn't do anything as horrible as commit suicide. But he was being treated in such a way that the end result of the kind of suffering he had was get to go get the gun and end it all. To be absent from the body, the irony is stark though as well. He also described while he was suffering, while it was so painful, how bad that it was, he still said, for the joy set before me. This is the irony. How can he talk about the joy set in front of him while this stuff was going on, this suffering was going on? He could look through the suffering and still talk about the joy of Jesus. Because he knew the scripture said in Hebrew 12 and 2, looking forward to that joy set before me when he would be you re reunited with the Father in oneness. In other words, Jesus would go back to heaven and he would be who he always was, and that was God. So he came here to take care of this little, little thing called sacrifice in order to save the world so he could go back and operate and be who he really was, and that was God Almighty. Uh, the pain, the agony, the irony that he was suffering had to be the most excruciating thing I can imagine. Now, I've lived long enough to go through some psychological issues, uh, and I know the, how much it hurts when you feel totally rejected and feel by yourself. Sometimes people try to comfort you, and uh, you get no comfort. And they might not can't comfort you. They might, they, they, people do what they're able to do. You, the loneliness that Jesus felt, and I got three things here before we close it tonight. One of them is loneliness. That loneliness that he felt on that cross by himself, it was like the whole world had deserted him. Like he had nothing and he had nobody. Jesus attracted vice, vast audiences and crowds, but it was a vacillating following. In other words, all the people that's following Jesus, we got to that cross. Nobody showed up. It's almost like you die and nobody come to your funeral. And, and that's got to be sad. Well, how many funerals we go to, the first question we ask, how many, was a lot of people there? Because the numbers of people indicate how well you was respected while you live. Here was Jesus, who was God himself, dying on the cross, and nobody shows up but Mary and maybe two women with her. Uh, and we're going to talk about Peter, James, John, and all the rest of them. They didn't show up. Uh, Peter denied him, and Judas sold him out, and the rest of them scattered. So he was the Lord Jesus Christ, who about two or three days before 
had thousands of people. And I talked about that Sunday in the message. He had come to Jerusalem on a donkey and the people went crazy. It was almost like a riot. And here we are two days later and not a one person was at the gravesite mourning, pleading for his life, begging, begging the, the soldiers to leave him alone while he laying on the cross, bleeding, dying, screaming, I can't breathe. There was nobody there, nobody there. 5,000 people who had been in Jerusalem, they said on Palm Sunday, by Friday, they killed Jesus. And these are the same people that killed him. The ones who was hollering his name and praising him and throwing palm leaves in front of him and taking off their coats so that the donkey could walk on a coat, which was supposed to have been how you should receive a king. It was he, he was dead from these people. They were the ones who hollered, crucify. These were the ones who a few days before had screamed, Hosanna, the Lord, our king. And I know you experienced something like this before. Sometimes the very people that you love the most or you think you love the most or you, or you think are your biggest supporters are people who do the most damage to you when you're in your lowest estate. And I don't want to talk about that that much. I want to stay stuck on this cross here tonight. But loneliness is what he felt. Rejection is what he felt. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Before he went to Jerusalem, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. So he had a week, a powerful week. Uh, people came to Jerusalem because they heard he had raised Lazarus from the dead. They wanted to see the man that raised Lazarus from the dead. Now you would think, and I would think, that if I had run into a man who had raised Lazarus from the dead, not raised Lazarus off of a sick bed, but Lazarus had been dead for three or four days in the grave. And if I had ran into the guy who raised him from the dead, you would think that I would be the most excited person in the whole wide world and do anything in my power to make sure that they didn't harm this man. But these same people, who come running up to Jerusalem to see him because of the Lazarus situation is are the same people that when Pilate washed his hand and said, do what you want to do with him because I, I, I'm tired of this trial. I'm sick of it. Y'all do what y'all want to do. When actually Pilate was supposed to have been the one that adjudicates the situation. Had he been a just judge, he would have said, let me see the case history. Let me hear the, the, the plaintiff's. Let me hear the defendants, uh, and then I will make a judgment. And the only judgment he could have made was the man is not guilty. Based upon the information y'all have given, he's not guilty. But he didn't. He said, you decide. And they did decide. They said, crucify, kill him. Now, let me go back for a minute here. Uh, the crucifixion was almost like the Roman gladiator days. It was a sport. and when there was going to be a crucifixion, everything closed down and everybody went down wherever it was going on at, on the hill of Golgotha. Usually it was outside of town on the hill so that everybody could see it. it. It was almost like the day off we can go to the ball game. And that's what happened when Jesus got crucified. You know, they, everything closed down so that the people could come in and see this, this horrible situation and, and laugh and jeer and and uh, make jokes about him, talk about him. He landed, he up there on the cross, bloodied and naked. And you know, they were saying all kinds of horrible things about it. And he was come, he was semi-conscious in and out. So he heard the stuff that they were saying. And we're talking about Jesus and his humanness at this point. That's what we're talking about, Jesus and his humanness. All right? But they actually relied on the circle of 12 friends. They were not there. They went there. Before he died, he went into Gethsemane because he said, I know I got to do this. He went into Gethsemane. Gethsemane is a garden in Jerusalem, Matthew 26, 20, 37. And he prayed all night and begged God, don't let me go through this. Now, this is, this is a really sad situation. Uh, on Thursday, he was praying uh, that I, please don't let me go through this. We're going to be fasting on Thursday. 
But he said, I, I don't want to have to do this. He knew in advance that he had to suffer by crucifixion. Now, how did Jesus know that? Because he was God. That's how he knew that he had to do this. He knew that he had to fulfill the law, which was that no man could be saved except with the shedding of blood, sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they had been making animal sacrifice for thousands of years, but it didn't work. It didn't save people because as soon as they got through making sacrifice, they go right back into the sin that they was doing. It wasn't the sin that was the issue. It was the re-sin that was the issue. The Lord delivers you from sin, but when you get up from it and turn around and go right back to it is what really is the issue. And so in order to stop this, God himself said, let me get up and go down there and become the sacrifice once and for all. And Jesus, who is manifested God on the earth, he knew I got to go down there. I got to keep, I, I got to become the sacrifice because only the shedding of my blood is going to stop this. For this purpose, he says in John 12, 27, have I come to this hour. He prayed this prayer in Gethsemane. He took James, John, Peter, and the rest of the disciples with him. And he said, y'all pray with me. Pray, pray with me. Sometimes all you need is somebody to help you pray through your situation. But sometimes what you cannot find is somebody to help you pray through your situation. So here was Jesus, God himself in the flesh, praying, save me from this. While the irony was he knew he couldn't be saved from it. Because had Jesus got up off the cross, you never would have been saved. And this world would have been in a more desperate situation than it is even right now. That's how important this cross situation was and is. That's how important it was. He knew his hardest days were ahead of him when he was in Gethsemane. It was here that Judas finally got his money because Judas one of the disciples betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. He sold him out. He told uh, the Romans, the people who came looking for Jesus, I'm going to tell you where he is. I'm going to tell you where to find him at. He's going to be at the garden of Gethsemane. And I'll point him out to you. You'll know which one it is because I'm going to show you. And the man said, okay, we'll, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. Now, I don't know what 30 pieces of silver translated into, but it was a little bit of money. And they gave it and Judas sold Jesus out. Uh, you also know the rest of the story is that when the soldiers finally got there, had got they uh, had got to identify who Jesus was, Peter jumped up into it and cut the soldier's ear off. Jesus told him, why did you do that? Well, why did you do that, Peter? Jesus put the ear back on. And then the next night, when they came looking for Jesus to get him, Peter said, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. I don't know where he come from. I don't know where he's going. Peter denied it. So here's his own disciples, selling them out and denying. Jesus left the garden with this word to the disciples. Matthew 26 and 40. He said, you couldn't even watch with me for one hour. That's all he prayed for about an hour. Now, y'all know how hard prayer is. We're going to pray on Thursday. Church is going to be open. I wonder who's going to come and pray for an hour. Probably we have saints going to come. They're going to come say a few words. They're going to get up and leave and go, which is fine. 30 pieces of silver, I'm being told, is about $200. But I guess $200 back then was a lot of money. <laughs> $200 back then probably was like $2 million. Uh, that's probably, well, let me say this. $200 is a lot of money to a lot of people today living in Sandusky. They sold him out. <laughs> they sold him out. My God. But he knew I, I had, I got to do this. He said, I got to do it. I don't want to do this, but if I don't do it, who's going to do it? They're not going to die for each other. They're not going to do it. He said, in the garden, if it be possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The cup was a cross, which was God's idea. It was God's will. You see, you, you can't thwart the will of God. Jesus, the mere thought, brought sweat like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This is the human part again of God 
in that garden. When he heard those words that uh, nevertheless, the, uh, the, this cup can't pass from you. He said the man started sweating and the sweat, it was like he was sweating blood. And, and that can happen. I'm told by medical people, Dr. Keyes is on, online tonight. Uh, he might can share with us that that is a possibility that when your calipraries bust, you can end up bleeding blood through your skin. And this is what happened to Jesus, that drops of blood fell to the ground like sweat because he probably was scared to death human, as a human being. It was probably the most scary thing that you can imagine that he's sitting there in the garden praying, please don't let me die, knowing that I got to die the whole time, scared to death as a human being. Uh, but that whole fear had to subside and he had to do this. It's called the cup of salvation. Had he not do, done this, there would be no salvation for you and for me. None at all, none whatsoever, none whatsoever. This is what makes and upset Satan so that Jesus actually did this so that you can be saved, so that you can have a right to the tree of life and you can have a right to heaven, the cup of salvation. He felt abandonment and betrayal. He tried waking up the disciples in the garden, but finally told them to sleep on and take your rest. The worst thing that can happen to you is tell you to sleep on, take your rest. Uh, they tell me that a man was working uh, and he went to sleep on the job. The supervisor came down. Uh, they tried to wake the man up, but couldn't he kept on sleeping. Supervisor let him sleep. As long as he sleep, he got a job. And he wake up, he fired. <laughs> Jesus told the disciples, sleep on, take your rest. Judas betrayed him. Judas betrayed him, he got arrested. And then Peter denied even knowing him. And all the disciples took off and fled. I don't know, the next time they all got together again, probably was just to do the last supper and just before, after the crucifixion, but they all went their separate ways. They abandoned him, betrayed him. Oh, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. He will not abandon you and he will not betray you like your friends will. Not only your friends, but your, your family. They will leave you out there in the cold. They, I don't think they mean to as much as they don't have the strength and the power within them. And they'll go so far. Most times people will only go so far because our number one objective is self-preservation. We're here to take care of ourselves. I'll help you until it requires too much of me. And when it requires too much of me, I'm finished. You're on your own. Hmm. This would happen to Jesus. That circle 12 finally said to him in that garden of Gethsemane, you're on your own. So they came and got him, uh, took him up to Golgotha Hill, crucified him. And when they got through, crucified him, took him to the grave, and he ends his life. Let me go into this next slide here. Uh, loneliness intensified beyond expectation. He screamed out, why have you forsaken me? He finally talked this thing out. He started talking, talking to uh, the father. Why have you forsaken me? Why, why, why would you put me through this? Uh, rejection had set in. There's nothing hurt more than rejection too. I don't know about y'all, but uh, I have felt rejection and to the point that it was almost clinical, uh, but it was so deeply psychological, I didn't even know it until I had actually got some talk or help from a, a trained counselor to help me to see what was going on, that I was feeling rejection to the point that it was dev devastating me psychologically. That's what rejection can do. We are social creatures. We hate being alone. We hate being isolated. When we feel uh, rejected and isolated, our behavior changes, we become very strange actors. Uh, what comes after rejection with Jesus is this state of silence, abject silence, maximum silence, when he just stopped talking to everybody. He just, the, the, the scripture says he got to the point where he did not say a mumbling word. Uh, and you've seen people like this. You've seen people who don't talk, uh, especially if you go to mental institutions. 
or you you are in situations where you're kind of counseling people uh, who are dealing with these kind of issues, they don't say nothing because rejection can be of such, it causes you to go into a state of silence. Uh, Sometimes you lose your voice, you lose your, your language, you, you lose, you don't know what to say. And this is what happened with Jesus from the human standpoint. He went into a state of abject silence and the scripture said he didn't say a mumbling word. He just marched along as they pushed him along. Isaiah 53 and seven said, like a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now he had a right to open his mouth because they was cussing him out. They was uh, calling them names. Uh, they was, and, 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 uh, and I think the next slide I'm gonna talk about spitting on him. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. James three and two, what made him perfect was that he didn't say nothing. He did not try to defend himself. And the Bible said that he didn't stumble, which made him perfect. Had he opened his mouth and tried to defend himself and try to talk back to him, he might've would have said the wrong thing. Uh, Sometimes we get in trouble when we try to defend ourselves. Sometimes you might need to let the Lord defend you. Another thing I got here about self-control, by being silent, he had developed this tremendous self-control over being able to handle uh, the physiological pain and the the psychological pain uh, because your words and your silence is power. Sometimes there's nothing more powerful than silence. And you know that the more you talk, the more you create argument. You know, but sometimes you just shut up and be quiet. The thing flares down, you even gain power. That's awful hard to do. Somebody say, man, it's awful hard not to say something when you're being accused, being hurt, uh, being talked about. But if you can learn just to shut your mouth and let Jesus fight your battle. Uh, he, he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes the city, Proverbs 16 and 32. If you can get control over your situation, you're powerful. He was tempted, but yet without sin. They wanted him to say something. But because he never said nothing against them or the situation, he never sinned. This is what made him God. One unguarded comment or any retort that showed that they were needling him would have been sin. They wanted him to say something, but he didn't. They wanted him to lose control, but he didn't. It made him even more madly uh, insane to kill him because the one of the reasons they beat him so bad because he wouldn't say nothing. They wanted him to. Now you're talking about some power. There, there lies the power right there. They had no control over him, no control over his spirit. You get control over your spirit and the devil gets angrier and more angry. Silence says it all. This is all while mocking him, beating him, blindfolding him, cursing him, spitting on him, utter and brilliant silence He never said a word, never said a word. When he did finally talk on the cross in his last words, before he said, it is finished, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. How can you forgive somebody who who is doing you wrong and you know that they are? That's power. Uh, Most of us don't understand forgiveness. How can you forgive somebody who's sitting there spitting on you, laughing at you, beating you down, but you say, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm. That made them even mad. That made them more mad. It's like when people want you to fight and you won't fight, they get even madder. (laughs) But it empowers you. He could have stopped this at any time. I'm getting close to the end of this presentation. This is the same man that just a few days before had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, if he can raise a man from the dead, he could have got up off that cross. 
uh, the, the only thing that comes to my mind here, how many of you saw the old movie King Kong, the original? It, it, the original, everybody saw that evidently. You remember when they brought King Kong on the stage, they had got him from wherever they took him from, brought him to New York, put him on stage, had him all chained down. They said he can't get away. Uh, don't worry about it. He started, he saw the, the girl and started the growl and they said, don't worry about it. He, 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 you, he won't be able to do no harm. You see, and you know what King Kong did? He broke them chains and towed that theater up and ended up on the, 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 the Empire State Building. Jesus could have called 10,000 angels at the drop of a hat. This was the same man who went to hell before he went to hell when he told Lazarus to come up out of hell and he just spoke it. He could have said this, I want angels to come right now and stop all of this, but he didn't. This is the man that put the ear back on the soldier's head after Peter had cut it off. Now I would think, this is just me and I probably end up thinking like these people. If I knew that he had put a man's ear back on a few days before, I wouldn't have been at the graveyard uh, fooling with this man. I wouldn't have done it because I would have recognized how much power he had. Even in death, he was merciful. Even he was dying. The physical pain, the, the crucifixion was regarded the worst kind of pain a man can experience. It was gruesome. It was humiliating. It was humane, it was barbaric, it was demonic. There was nothing like this that had ever taken place before. What they did to our Lord and our Savior uh, during that week that they crucified him. And that's what you got to get in your head. You got to get to the place where you recognize how gruesome this was, how humiliating. And this was all for the saving of your soul. He did this so that you could be saved. He did it so that you wouldn't have to suffer like this physically. And he did it so that basically so that you would have a right to go to heaven. You know, that, that's what he did it for. Uh, he didn't even say that you weren't going to suffer. But he said that uh, this will ensure that you will have a seat in the kingdom because I did this for you. I sacrificed. I became the ultimate sacrifice. Anytime you hear blood song, you ought to jump up and start shouting. Anytime you hear, every time the saints break out and at the cross, at the cross, you ought to be the first one to jump and break out in the dance when you recognize that this was done so that I could be saved, so that I would have a right to the tree of life. The whipping, a few things I'm uh, getting ready to kind of close here. They, they beat him to death before he even got to the cross. If you remember correctly, uh, they made him carry the cross. It was one man that, that Simon, uh, who uh, carried the cross for him for a little while. Simon was the son of Rufus. Uh, that's where my name comes from out of the Holy Scripture. Uh, they carried the cross of Jesus because the thing was so heavy. It weighed, it weighed hundreds of pounds that he had to carry through the streets of Jerusalem. The nails that they put inside his wrists were five to seven inches and the ankles, they nailed him to the cross. But then they put this heavy crown of thorns on his head and pressed it down in his head. I don't know how he took all of this. The cross itself was sitting in a big old hole. They dug a big old hole. There wasn't no cement, so they couldn't make it stable. They just threw the cross in the hole. And every time the wind would blow, the cross would move and it would tear the skin of the person on the cross. So the pain, every time he moved by the wind, he had to be screaming out, hollering. That's why he was saying, why have you forsaken me? I'm talking about major screaming. Uh, the naked skin against the rough cross. You got to remember, they stripped him naked. Now, we see pictures of him with, with something comparable to shorts on, but he was naked. And so his skin was being torn from the back uh, on that cross. Every time it moved, it just tore more flesh off of him, off of his skin. And you who have had your skin pulled, uh, you know how painful that can be. Uh, the naked skin against the rough crawl, insects flying all around him, uh, vultures, 
when the vultures smelled the blood, they just came. That's what vultures do. When they smelled, felt, smelled this blood, they came and started picking at the body of Jesus. And they started picking at him. Usually they, they, they wait before they start taking the eyes out and they make sure that they safely can do it. But they kept plucking at his body the whole time he's up on the cross. Then gravity itself is what killed this person because his body was really being pulled apart, literally. Uh, his hands in the air, his feet uh, in the uh, head in the ground, the, the, the elements pulled his body apart and the exposure from the sun and the dehydration, because he's up there all day. And so the dehydration, so by the time he did finally die, he probably had no fluids in his body almost at all. And then the, uh, the way that his body was situated, it really caused asphyxiation. He died because he couldn't breathe. He couldn't breathe. His breathing was cut completely off. That's what Floyd, George Floyd said. I can't breathe. Somebody said to me, as we talk about George Floyd, that he died from the man's uh, he said he died from a heart attack. It really wasn't that man's knee. It was a heart attack. So I said to him, I think I told you this earlier, we all all die from heart attacks. Our heart stopped, but it stopped from something that caused it to stop. Oh, and this death caused Jesus' heart to stop. Fight or flight steps in, and the sweat glands activated capilla, capillaries. That's what I want to say ruptured his veins popped and when they popped that's when the blood just shot out he was robbed of his dignity and it's said by those who study this kind of stuff that he lost 20 percent of his blood he suffered a hypovolemic shock and he went into causing great vomiting mental confusion because he had to be out of his mind by this time dizzy and he lost consciousness and he just died. He put his head down. And before he died, he said, it is finished. Horrible death. Horrible death. And we have never hardly seen anything like it. This all for our sin and iniquity. He knew no sin before this. He became the lamb slain before the beginning of the world, save the world. What the law could not do, he did. It was not fair but it was pure justice for us. It was pure justice for us. It was the way sin was punished. But because he did this, we don't have to go through this excruciating experience anymore. Uh, because he did this and our sins was forgiven, they are forgiven now. Had he not did this, but had he not sacrificed his blood, there could not have been forgiveness of sin because it's only because of the shedding of his blood could we be free. It wasn't fair, but it was justice. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It took two things to satisfy God's justice. One, Jesus is sinless life. Had he had sin in his life, he couldn't pull this off. The shedding of his blood, those two things pulled this off. The purpose of Jesus' death was not to bring about a perfect condition on the earth because man, man is imperfect, but it was to prepare us to be able to go to heaven. You couldn't have been able to go to heaven had not Jesus died on the cross. So the cross for us should be a celebratory kind of situation. We should rejoice and we should give him glory and give him praise every time it comes to our minds. Every time it comes to our minds, it should give us just pause to praise him in such a way that's almost unbelievable. Ah, uh, I think that's about it. Is that, is that Brother Kevin Lee? That's it. Anybody got any questions about the death of Jesus or the statement that I made, I can't breathe, or the blood or the sacrifice? 